Coming up on episode 23 of the Art Podcast, we are on location at Art Studio Conf 2018, and we have some conversations with Romain Francois and Thomas Lean Peterson. I hope you enjoy this episode. So, are you ready? Thank you so much for listening. This is episode 23 of the Art Podcast. My name is Eric Nance, and I am very excited to be talking with you. And I am on location currently in San Diego, California, for the 2018 edition of Art Studio Conf. I was at the same conference last year, and it was a terrific experience. And I can tell you that this year I am expecting that and hopefully more. I am hearing that there are a lot more attendees even than last year. It's it's a very high in demand uh, conference and I'm very fortunate to be here. And one of the reasons I really enjoy going to these is connecting with the art community. I've really enjoyed talking and meeting with a lot of people Um, You've heard their voices on previous episodes, and that's going to be similar in the next batch of episodes because we will be talking with a lot of these uh, highly influential members of the community, both just in the general R ecosystem and even for me personally. I've met a lot of good friends, and I can't wait to bring some of their thoughts and their insights to you uh, for your listening pleasure. So while we're on the subject of community, before we get to our two guests for for this episode, I thought it was a good chance for me to kind of talk about something I don't think I really talked about on my particular podcast, but I've seen some really excellent uh, resources online and even other presentations outside this conference about you know, getting connected with the community that we have in the in the R ecosystem, the R world, and ideas for how you can kind of showcase your talents uh, to the rest of the community. So I wanted to kind of give you my impressions of a few resources that have come up um, within the, say, past half year or so that I think had I seen these even bef- well before when I was first kind of starting out, they would have really helped me a lot. Um, I'll kind of get to why I think that as I, as I talk about these. Um, the first um, resources I want to mention is from Emily Robinson. She is a data scientist at Etsy, and I really enjoyed hearing her previous talks, but she wrote a couple really nice um, and frankly quite powerful uh, posts to me that I read. Um, one of which was called Building Your Data Science Network, Finding Community. And this really struck a lot of, you know, chords with me. I think there's a lot of great advice that we all can, can learn from. So you often hear about to be successful, you have to build a professional or just some kind of network. You might think that means a lot of people. Well, that not necessarily the case. I mean, it's not about how many you have but it's about who you have and how you interact with them. And so she has some good advice about how do you want to become part of a community, whether it's R or anything else, but of course this is the R podcast, I'm gonna talk about R. Um, So she wrote, it's actually the first of two posts about this, and I'm obviously trying to follow the first advice. I'm attending a meetup, albeit a really, really big one. Um, That's a good way to kind of put faces with names that you see online, and that's something what I'll be planning to do in my time here. Um, She has some good advice about, you know, what kind of venues are out there, depending on what your interests are. And then more, this always resonates with me, even though I have been doing this kind of thing off and on for a few years, 
even I still get you know a little shy, a little nervous when I'm in these uh, rather large settings and looking for people to talk to. So it's just, just some general advice about what are some you know conversation starters, how you kind of approach people, but you know it's about not just like being kind of wishy-washy with you know your opening line, but really get to why are we here at this particular venue or what what makes you interested in something like R? What are your favorite things to work on? Or what are maybe or some challenges you work on? But just be a little more specific. Don't always kind of be so general of and, you know, just try to get try to get those uh, conversations started, you know, a little more a little more specifically. I think that helps. And outside of, you know, personal interactions in terms of like at these meetups, um, this was something that I could not foresee when I first started this and now I'm starting to see the value of it albeit you know I'm still not as natural to me but getting involved with Twitter I mean at least in this in the our community side I think Twitter has largely been a very valuable resource a welcoming resource and everybody's been very friendly from what I can see so I think in this case you know, sometimes Twitter gets, you know, obviously a bad rap in certain situations, but I, I definitely see value in you know, seeing what resources people are sharing back and forth. But it's a great way to reach out with people and kind of get their thoughts on things. And she has some good advice about what other people have said about connecting with people. So I'll definitely um, talk about those as I as I keep going here. And then um, other things that she kind of mention is how we um, if you're at one of these meetups or conferences you know it's great that if you see something that you really you know gain insights with you really enjoy looking at or enjoy hearing you know don't be afraid to put a live tweet about it so to speak so lots of people are probably better at this than I am but I by the time you hear this you may see some of mine that I put out there when I've been listening to a talk and I it really resonates with me on a certain level I just want to share that and you know it's not just to share with all of you it's also admittedly kind of share with me too so I can look back on this I can think of which talks I was really impacted by on top of the notes I take of course but it's a good kind of timeline of the things I found interesting so yeah Emily did yeah that post and she also um did another post about re how you can reach out effectively, kind of virtually, so to speak, to others in the community. So she has some good advice there. Um, the next uh, resource I'll highlight is uh, from John McIntosh. He wrote a post called Time to Shine, Blogging and Social Media for Introverts. Now, again, I think, I th I'd, I'd imagine some of you can relate to this. Um, I've seen a lot of people where it seems like it's really easy for them to share things online through blogs or like I said Twitter things like that I've never been quite as natural to me but what I liked about this post is that he definitely makes me feel like I'm not alone <laughs> some of us have to really kind of struggle with this but he really I guess the, the key message is is that don't be afraid and don't don't shortchange yourself. I mean, I've I've actually kind of said this internally for a local R group that I do at work. I want everybody, no matter what their experience level, to contribute any insights they've learned so that we all can learn from each other. And I think it's kind of similar just even in the open, open source world of R, so to speak. Um, I definitely have areas I think I maybe I've held back a little bit on sharing because I know I don't know as much as some of the leading, you know, the leading developers of, say, coming from our studio themselves or just a lot of these, a lot of members of the community are really, really good at uh, concise and powerful exploratory data analysis. And I'm kind of, I've been in an industry where a lot of my stuff is not so exploratory, it's quite rigid, and I'm trying to build my skills up. But anyway, I'm kind of rambling a little bit. But what I'm saying is, is that uh, John's post really spoke to me about it's not about you trying to brag or anything. It's just if you've learned something interesting, 
don't be afraid to share it. And the best part is, is that if there are pe- the people are going to be welcoming with, say, give me advice if, if you're asking for it. But it's just don't, like I said, don't kind of shortchange yourself. Take a deep breath and try it, and you'd be surprised. So I guess hearing my my this this little venture I do is kind of my way of doing that but I actually have plans on doing more than just this which hopefully will come to fruition this year but anyway I thought it was it was a good read so obviously all the links to these will be in the show notes as well and then um actually Emily's post kind of referenced this next one I'll talk about is from uh, Rachel Thomas who wrote a post about making peace with personal branding this kind of has some relationships to what John's post was doing, but it's one of those things where, yeah, a lot of us are kind of shy about, quote, tooting our own horn, so to speak. That's just an expression for trying to talk about things that you are, you know, maybe proficient at or good at. Um, but, you know, Rachel was kind of saying that it's, it's not, you're not going to sound shallow or anything. It's not like you're trying to be popular or something. Um, this is about really putting what you can contribute out there, but it's it's a way for you to get feedback too. And, you know, she has some advice about how you can kind of observe how pe- other people are doing this if you're not sure of how you want to approach it. You can kind of see how other people do it on Twitter, for example. That's a, a key point. Or, you know, looking at how she prepares for speaking at a meetup or a conference. So... It's one of those things where if you want to do more public speaking, yeah, try to find those opportunities, say through a local R user group, maybe a, a, an R ladies meetup if you go to those. I mean, any anything like that. And she has some good resources on if you're not as natural at pub, public speaking, you know, some things that you could you could look at too. And then the other part is having an online presence via blogging. Now, I will have likely the next episode, I'll be talking about how I plan to augment some more blogging with what you're hearing, of course, in the usual episodes. But the other point I'll make more clearly in the next episode is it is frankly much more easier than it ever was that if you're an R, an, a data scientist using R, it is so easy now to get a blog going and put your thoughts out there and have it reliable so that you can just concentrate on your content. So I've, like I said, I've got, I got some, a lot of thoughts on that. And the only other thing I'll say is that if you go to my site for the podcast, which is r podcast.org, you're going to see it looks a lot different than it did about a year ago. Um, because I am now using the blog down package that's powered by Hugo. So I think it's looking really good. I hope you enjoy it. And I'll be speaking more about how that's really helping me and what visions I have in the future um, in likely the next episode. So yeah, I'll put links to all these uh, resources I mentioned in the show notes. But it's one of those things where, yeah, I've been away from this for a while and I'm going to conferences like this. You know, I'm always looking for ways that I can be a little more you know, getting more connected with the community. So this is a good kind of preparation, you know, reading for that. Um, Speaking of community, before I get to our our interviews that we recorded for this, um, one of the efforts I've joined since you last heard me on a previous episode is I've kind of become one of the curators of a really excellent site, which I have mentioned in the past, but it's called rweekly.org. Um, R Weekly is a wonderful service that kind of gives you highlights of some really interesting stories from the R community, wherever it's, you know, using R to get insights into new, you know, data science analyses, new packages that you should keep your eye on, um, lots, lots of other uh, categories too. Um, I've, really like the vision of it and it's been a lot of fun to to put in a few stories here and there and kind of help curate a lot of the content and at the conference i've come prepared with a boatload of our weekly stickers because you know how it is it's not a conference unless you exchange hex stickers but no these turn out really well so i'm kind of trying to be an ambassador for our weekly since 
I mean, I was hoping that we could have some other members of the team over here, but obviously these conferences, it's hard to travel. So um, definitely if you're interested in joining that effort, I have a link to our weekly on the main site and we always welcome contributors and it's certainly a welcoming team. So I'm been privileged to be a part of that. And I certainly hope that at the conference, I've been able to spread the word a lot so we can get a lot more people to check it out and, you know, hopefully enjoy it. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard, you've heard enough of me um, to introduce all this, but we have two um, really exciting interviews for you to kick off our coverage. Um, I'll be first chatting with Romain Francois, and then we'll also we'll end it with a chat with Thomas Lean Peterson. These are two people that I've admired for a while, um, and Romain in particular. When I first started using R, he was um, made an excellent resource that kind of got me going. And he's, you'll hear what he's been up to. And then Thomas Lynn Peterson, he is, um, I don't know how he does it. He's made some excellent advances in the community via his packages. So I can't wait for you to hear all that. So, okay, There's, let's just get right to it. Let's start out with my chat with Romain Francois. <laughs> All right, welcome back, everybody. The R Podcast coverage of R Studio Comp 2018 continues, and I have the very uh, great pleasure of meeting someone from the R community that I've been following since literally when I first got involved with R, who has been one of the founding members of a very key package that we'll talk about. I am sitting with Romain Francois. Romain, thanks for joining me today. Hello, thanks for having me on the, on the podcast. Absolutely. So um, you are, like what most people will know you for is that you are one of the founders of the powerful and obviously very important RCVP package. And it's served as a foundation for hundreds of other packages in the community. So going from where RCPP began to where it is today, what are some of your takeaways on how massive the growth has been and where do you see it going in the future? It's, it's been quite an impressive package uh, to be involved with. I, um, so writing RCPP was kind of my way to learn C++ at the time. And, uh, and I think we did a good job of it. It's, uh, it's now, as you said, foundation for like hundred or even thousands of packages. And this is, uh, yeah, I'm quite happy with it. On, on, the, other, on the other end though, uh, there are things that maybe now I would do a bit differently oh, like about maybe it. Maybe a couple of examples of that. Yeah. Uh, well, it takes forever to compile uh, a package <laughs> that uses RCBP. <laughs> and and we, we're starting to see packages which used to use RCBP that now uh, sort of come back to the, uh, the straight R API. Okay. So, yeah, maybe there's a space for like doing a lighter version of it. Mm. And obviously I'm always uh, keen on, on the future. So right. I'm always keen on trying to play with um, new standards of C++. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years, well, not a couple of years ago, but uh, some time ago I, I started working on uh, like a fork of RCBP uh, specialized on C++ 11. Mm -hmm. But this is all news now because uh, we have C++ 17 and, um, right, right. and, and C++ 20 is just around the corner. Yes. And maybe at some point if I ever uh, get time, that's the thing I struggle with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to sort of revisit uh, how to connect R and C++ uh, aimed at newer standards. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I know C++ is obviously such a huge foundation in, in open source and seeing it grow immensely. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be kind of difficult to keep up with it a little bit. Or Yeah, it is. And, and, and um, the, the success of RCBP and um, the way it's being min maintained at the moment doesn't really allow for uh, breaking it too mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's pretty stable uh, now. I, I'm not too involved in the project anymore because I like to play with things. I'm, not, I'm, not <laughs> I'm less interested in maintaining than, than I'm 
interested in, in playing things. So I guess if I come back to that project, there'll be a different different package. I see. Uh, I see. But we'll, we'll see. I'd, but yeah, this has been a theme for me to uh, connect R and uh, other languages. It's if if I if I look back, I've, I've played with R Java uh, right uh, at 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 some point at the beginning. And I, uh, I have mixed feelings about that one, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean that 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 was fun. And m so my involvement with it was that. Um, I, exactly, I had mixed feeling about about the syntax. It was mm -hmm. too low level for me. Okay. And so um, at at the time, I helped uh, Simon to uh, write like a higher level, uh, higher level um, abstractions on, on on top of it. You know the the capital J uh, syntax. Right. Right. But this uses Java reflections, so it then is. A bit slow, so people still use the uh, the, l the lower level uh, interface. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And now I've uh, done this uh, RCPP work, and I'm always keen on on finding other languages to to connect with with R. I think R is such a great language, but we should open to uh, what other languages can do for us. Yeah, I think um, that was highlighted a lot with um, John Chambers' recent new book about integrating R across all these different, you know, libraries of our, of our architectures or system languages. And going on that thread, you've actually recently started working with the Go language. So I'm kind of curious what your experience of Go has been. I've my experience of Go has literally just been my site's powered by Hugo and Blogdown, which uses Go on the back end. So I'm not well versed in it at all. But what have been kind of the things you've been exploring with Go, and where do you, where do you see the advantages for that as a future binding to R? This was this was actually my my, my trigger as well. I uh, I started to play with uh, with Hugo and Blockdown, and uh, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, let's see what's uh, let's see what's there. Can I uh, open you know look under the carpet and see what 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 happens? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, this is such a great thing with like many open source things is that you can just play with things and see how things work and um, and like I was instantly driven to all right so this is nice language how can I how can I connect it with with R and what what can I do how can I leverage my experience of having worked on RCPP and stuff in that language i don't have any particular um goal in mind it's not like i want to interface that particular go package i'm not looking for anything specific okay and uh, i'm i sort of have the same mindset that i had uh when i started working on rcpp uh, back in the days it's i j it's just i wanted to to play with something and mm -hmm. uh, we at the time we just had no idea that it would be so um Fundamental to uh, other other things. So maybe if we if we do something with this uh, R and Go binding, which might be ended up, which might end up be called uh, Ergo, like E R G O. Oh, neat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, I I don't know if if we if we give that to 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 people. Maybe some great things will come out of it. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, but Go is such a nice uh, language. Uh, it's sort of what C++ should have been if it didn't really bring all of the C weird stuff uh, oh, okay. with it. That's a great way to think of it, because I've always wondered where does Go kind of place itself in, in that in that ecosystem. Okay, that's a that's a good nugget to share. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a bit simpler and nicer to use than mm -hmm. uh, than C++, and I think it's a good thing. Because, uh, well, to take advantage of C++ within the world of R, you don't need to know too much C++, right? You just Good point. need to be able to do for loops and manipulate vectors and, 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 and you're done with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to know everything there is to know about, about, uh, about C++, there's, there's just a lot of things, and a lot of confusing uh, different patterns of, of how to, to do C++. And Go sounds uh, simpler, and um, 
maybe that could bring people who want to get performance without having to go into um, into C++. Yeah. And yeah, maybe that I, I my hope is that if I if I if I ever get the time to work on the project, my hope is that this will trigger things that we don't imagine now. Right. Yeah. But there's a, there's an interesting, you know, thread that you kind of mentioned there is that we see, you know, major, you know, um, ecosystems like RCPP and all the things around it. We don't see usually how it started, but it's kind of like what you said. It's like you're, you're playing with it a little bit, seeing how things work. Yeah. And then once you put it out there, then you start seeing the massive growth of how people can find these interesting bindings and yeah. make things in R that would not have been possible without something like that. So I think... It's interesting that Go could be a, a similar starting point. Yeah. So I'll and definitely keep my eyes on it. And then there's Rust around the corner. That's and, true, uh, yeah. Why not? I mean, that, I could, know. Be that could be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been keeping up with Rust a little bit. I know that's part, major part of like Firefox and the work that they're doing. So very cool. Yeah. Very cool. But what I want to do is, is take advantage of the experience that I had. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to be honest, the mistakes that I made uh, while working on, on RCVP and, and, uh, and, and sort of do the same ish for for go that'd be that'd be good cool well i'm definitely gonna keep an eye on that one so um going back in the way back machine a little bit um one of the <laughs> things that you worked on when i first started using r and in particular is trying to find ways to create more interesting plots as you had launched uh the r graph gallery now, i remember bookmarking that right away when i was starting <laughs> with things so um Kind of where where does that stand in kind of the work that you do, and maybe what's your take on some of the newer visualization you know mechanisms that we have using things like HTML widgets or Shiny or other interactive things? Kind of what's your what's your thoughts on that? So this was this was my way in into the community. Mm. Um, so at the at the time we were uh, speaking through the R help mailing list. I know that is still on, but I, I just don't have the uh, the time to keep going on, on there. I'm already quite stimulated with uh, uh, Twitter and various uh, ways to, to get news. Oh, right, right. Right, so, but at, at the time, uh, I, I don't know, this was my way in, in, the, in the community. Uh, I just learned, and, and once again, this is like learning in the, uh, in the open somehow. Right. I was like learning how to do graphics, and how can I, how can I sort of make that information available to uh, to to other people? And so, uh, and at the same time, it was my way to learn how to make uh, websites with PHP and whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of fun. For some reason, I I just at some point I abandoned the project. Um, but someone has uh, has picked it up now. There's a, there's a, like a new version of the uh, of of the gallery. Cool. We'll have a link to it. Absolutely. And uh, I, I don't recall the uh, the URL, but Google will we'll find, find it. You. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, but at at some point, it it was. Uh, if if I had to do it again now, I I, I guess I'd use something like GitHub and pull request to uh, submit new uh, graphics sure. and. Uh, and probably do it on top of Hugo or something. Oh yeah, yeah, it's so but elegant for these things. Yep, very cool. Um, but yeah, I uh, this there's just too much of uh, graphics and uh, different ways to 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 express yourself graphically with with, with R. Yeah, so yeah, this was difficult to 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 keep up at the at the time, and 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 people keep talk to me about this uh, this website and uh, and yeah. Well, was a, that was a good adventure. Yeah, but it was like kind of that's another interesting point you mentioned. A lot of people are kind of scared to try something and put it out there right away because they'll, you know, they'll view it as like a failure if they get something wrong. But just try it out. I mean, this is a welcoming community, community yeah. and it's a it's a great way to to learn and in interact with people. So that's that's awesome advice. Um, so yeah, let, yeah. Sh we should not be scared of of anything uh, if we have an idea. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only half-baked or something, uh, people will genuinely come and talk to you and, 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 and try to make it better. And uh, yeah, this is a really welcoming community. 
Sure. Very, very good, very good. Um, so on your site, you mentioned that you are a consulting dad detective. <laughs> so the, I can't pronounce anything. Um, yeah, I can't I ca either. I, this was this was a mistake because I'm not able to <laughs> to pronounce it. Yeah, so I like to make up words, but well. um, uh, when the words are out there, uh, I I just didn't read, didn't think about how to pronounce them. <laughs> it's like so, someone yesterday asked me uh, how do you pronounce the uh, reprex. Yes, yeah, right. And uh, and I I just never th thought of it. It's just a written word for me, and I, I never had the idea to pronounce it. That that's one interesting thing when you hear people finally talk about the packages they're working on that we see it in writing. It's like, oh wait, I pronounce it that way. And no, they say it the other way. Like Hadley's done that with some of the packages he works on. I'm like, oh well, how would I? Yeah, I just, <laughs> many people have different ways to say deep liar. Oh uh, yeah, see that's the thing. I always called it deep plier. I don't know why, but just did. But yeah. Yeah, it comes from the the plier. So. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's a good point too. Um, so yeah, you work for um, Think R, and are you one of the founders of that company, or what? What's your role I'm, there? I'm I'm just like a simple employee there, and okay. but but that's uh, that's a question many people ask me actually. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's a small company yet. Uh, at the moment, there's uh, five of us. And okay. uh, so we sort of do a lot of training, a lot of consulting, making packages for people, making mm -hmm. shiny apps and stuff like that. Interesting. And uh, yeah, it's, be, it's, been, it's been good. We are in a sort of a, in a good position in the, in the French market because mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a need for uh, consultants in speaking French uh, there. Okay. And we're sort of going into that niche somehow, but there's a, there's a lot of work. Yeah, well, so that's that's awesome. So that if you're listening yeah. and you and you sort of want to just just come and talk to us, and uh, we're always happy to to welcome new uh, people who like R and uh, French, I guess. Absolutely, <laughs> we'll put a link in the show notes if people cool. are more interested. So um, it's been awesome to talk with you. Um, for those that want to keep up with your work, you know, what are the best ways they can reach you and um, where, can, where, do they, where can they find you? Twitter probably is, is the easiest. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll have a link to your Twitter handle in the show notes. So, um, well, Romain, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Um, again, it's one it's of those been fun. Thank you. awesome times where I get to meet so many people that have changed the way I, I work with R and you are. This must be tiring. How many people are you see, do you, do you, will you see uh, during the conference? So, yeah, I mean, I, I've, <laughs> it's amazing. This conference is huge. Like yeah. there are lots of people that I've, I've seen for the first time that I've been following quite a bit. So cool. I'm definitely gonna have thoughts about that. But yeah, thanks for taking the time and uh, we'll definitely chat again in the future. Cool, thanks for having me. All right, everyone, we'll be back right after this. Welcome back, everybody. So one of the biggest uh, joys I get out of going to these conferences is meeting people that I've been following in the art community for a long time, but finally get to meet them in person. And it is my pleasure to welcome Thomas Peterson to the show. So Thomas, thank you for joining me today. No problem. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so for our listeners that may not be familiar with your, you and your work, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and kind of how you got started using R? Oh sure. Um, so I'm uh, I'm from Denmark. I uh, currently work at the Danish Tax Authority so as a data scientist, mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of compulsory in, uh, in developing R packages. So uh, yeah, I think I think I have worked with R like in 12 years, but mainly like using it for statistical uh, analysis uh, at first, and mm -hmm. the whole R packaging thing has been ramping up in the last two, three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and, and I've developed kind of whatever package I find interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of visualization work. I do a lot of uh, work with network analysis. Um, yeah. yeah, kind of all over the plate. Uh, so yeah. Very cool. And um, when I first saw your name, it's after you were a ggplot2 quote intern for, for yeah. Hadley uh, back in 2016, I believe. Yeah. So, um, what kinds of things did you tackle when you did that quote internship, and have you been maintaining or working on ggplot2 since? 
Yeah, so um, yeah, I was like for two or three months. I was uh, I was working with Hadley uh, on on ggplot2, um, mainly doing so. So the main part of it was to to move the fastening system uh, into this new extendable uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, ggplot2 version two had just been released in the winter, and and it provided a lot of uh, extension possibilities, mm -hmm. and and I kind of jumped at that uh, very soon, but also found that. I wanted to to be able to extend the fasting system, and that was not possible. Okay. So um, so I just kind of asked him whether uh, he would accept a PR uh, if I began doing it, and, and he said sure, and, and then that kind of led to the internship. So so that was kind of the the more interesting part of the internship, but of course there was also like uh, mm -hmm. bug fixing and and just making sure the next release was was nice. Um, and then he, he kind of repeated it with Karawu uh, the yep. year after. Um, so, so we are kind of the, the interns that I wouldn't say we, I, I wouldn't say at least that I spend that much time anymore on, on kind of maintaining uh, GDplot2. Um, it's been a while since I made a bug fix at least. Okay. Um, but I still, I still keep tab on it and still make some, some PRs now and then, um, sometimes for selfish goals because I need some. Uh, functionality for my own packages, um, mm -hmm. but also just yeah, keeping it in, in good shape. Yeah, that's uh, very impressive, and we'll talk a little bit later about some uh, newer packages you're making that sure. deal with GGBot too. But you did mention a little bit some packages around network visualizations and network representation. So tell me a little bit about the motivation for creating those, and what's your your vision for all that? Um, well, it's kind of interesting because I, d I don't really do any network analysis at the moment, okay. um, and I'm, I'm not not trained in any way to to do like network analysis. Um, so there's a lot of people that probably know way more about this stuff than me. Um, the reason why I got into it was because I wanted uh, I wanted to be able to better visualize networks. I, I did some stuff in my PhD that were at least tangibly related to uh, to networks, and I I wanted a nicer way to to visualize it. Um, so so that ggref, which is uh, this package I've built to to kind of makes uh, relational data available as a, as a data backend in, uh, in ggplot2, uh, kind of sprung out from there. Um, and that led to tidygraph, which is like a dplyr-ish uh, package for working with, with networks, with this uh, tidy, tidyverse uh, verbs. Mm -hmm. um, so they, it kind of just grew organically from a very, very small use case. And I've spent way too much time on it, um, so uh, I better just keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of. I, I think I'll I'll probably dive a bit more into network analysis at, at work um, soon. So I, I hope that mm -hmm. at least um, it's also it's nice to be the user of your tools now and then. Oh, otherwise sure. you can Absolutely. otherwise you can uh, become a, a bit too detached from. From the actual use case of whatever you're trying to develop, so it's it's right. good to be to be an actual user, not just for for the sake of, of writing blog posts or something like that, but actually Absolutely. try to do solve things with your with your stuff. Um, yeah, but just in general, I think network uh, networks are interesting. I, I like mm -hmm. the the nature of them, the things that you can kind of ask them about, and I think it's a it's an area in R that has been. Uh, there's a lot of great packages around it, but but in in the area of, of, of having a nice API, I think it has been lacking, um, and this is what I've been trying to solve. Yeah, I think it's really elegant, and actually, I'll probably follow up with you maybe off recording, so to speak, because I'm working on a project that work that visualizes a network, but I predefine how everything looks, so to speak. So, mm -hmm. I'll, yeah. But I think this this could be immensely helpful for some of that, and. Sure. Um, You've also been working, interestingly, with um, a newer package to look at black box models and kind of interpreting the results of that. So maybe you could tell yeah, us sure. about that. So, yeah. so this is like something completely different. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's, so, so this is called Lime, which is uh, it's a port of a Python uh, library, um, which was developed by the people that developed the methods. So, so this mm -hmm. is kind of a just close your eyes and try to translate whatever they, they were doing. But so Lime is, uh, is an approach to explaining whatever model that, uh, that you put at it. It's just a black box and, and Lime stands for local interpretable model agnostic explanations, um, which doesn't roll as nicely off the tongue. Yeah, so, not so, quite. It's <laughs> going to, so it's going to just be, be Lime from now on. And, and 
this is something that has been been part of my my day to day work. So so this is something we need in the Danish tax authorities because mm -hmm. there's going to be some new uh, regulations in in EU called uh, GDPR, oh. which requires every kind of uh, decision based on algorithms that affects the citizens of the country to. Um, to be explainable in human terms to that citizen on, upon request, okay. which is, uh, I think it's a good thing. I mean, we are public servants, so we should not just kind of throw whatever crazy stuff uh, we have out there. But it, of course, it puts kind of a, a pressure on data scientists because a lot of the, the models that we use are extremely complex and not just explainable, not even to, to like an expert. It's, it's difficult to kind of say, well, this random forest model did this in this uh, instance because of these uh, these variables. So um, so Lime is a way to kind of address that. Uh, it, it takes a single uh, a single observation that you want to explain. So it doesn't explain the whole model. Usually the whole model cannot be explained because they are nonlinear and, and, and so on. But, sure. but for a single observation, it can try to, to explain which part of this uh, observation was the main driver for the model choosing whatever it chose. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is really cool, and uh, yeah, it's been fun to, to work at. It's it's way different than what I usually work on in R. So so right. it's, it's nice to just play around with that as well. Yeah, yeah, and then um, getting to how diverse your your development um, in R has been, I've also been really intrigued by your Fiery package for sure. kind of API work or yeah. kind of web service API. So. I'm sure you, you can explain way better than me. Uh, please tell our listeners what Fiery yeah, is. Yeah, all about. so so Fiery is uh, is a, the main package in a, an ecosystem that I'm trying to build up around, like developing web servers in R. Mm -hmm. um, this is an area that is getting increasingly filled out with different approaches to right. to to making yeah different web technologies in R. Uh, mm -hmm. Shiny is of course the the main uh, known package for this, um, but I have. I have lacked a package that kind of is low level, so you have access to the actual HTTP request, you have access to the response that is getting uh, thrown back to the to the client, mm -hmm. but is easier to work with than, than working with HTTPU, which is, is kind of the underlying package that powers all of these, like Shiny and Fiery and OpenCPU and Plumber. They yes. all use HTTPU. Uh, under underneath it all, okay. but it's not it's not really easy to work with directly. So I wanted like a, a layer on top of that, but not so much that it became magical. So it's okay. uh, it, so if you're not familiar with web technologies, Fiery is not a nice package to work with. It's it's for people that are, are used to making the the backend part of, of servers. But if mm -hmm. if you're used to that or if you you get into that, then Fiery will take a, a lot of the annoyance out of, of uh, developing a web server from the ground up. Oh, I see. Yeah, for a lot of the projects, you know, Shiny meets maybe 90% of my needs, but I'm getting increasingly in some situations where it is kind of a bit opinionated on how it interacts with a web service. So it may be nice to have like Fiery or Plumber or some combination of that to customize, uh, like you said, at a lower level. So I think it's Absolutely. a great benefit. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's, so, so Fiery is, uh, I hope that it will be become kind of a, a backbone in a in a small mm -hmm. ecosystem because it's so so you can develop plugins for Fiery which would kind of take the pain out of certain aspects of developing a web server. It's uh -huh. it's quite like so it's a bit inspired by by ExpressJS, which is a well-known web service in uh, Node, which also just kind of people are developing stuff that well, for that that kind of. Um, how do you say, like expand what it can do. And, okay. and I hope that that will be become uh, possible with Fiery as well. But people need to s kind of help me with that because yeah. I don't have that much time. So, sure. so I, yeah, I hope that people will pick it up. But if they are, if they're not, then it's just because it's not that useful to people. And that's just kind of the game with, uh, with open source community. So well, I know, yeah, you've done a few blog posts about kind of your, your motivation for it. And I am intrigued about just trying out even a proof of concept kind of thing, even if it's not, it's like a toy situation. But I want to sure. see how it really talks, like you said, at a little level. So we'll probably yeah. talk about that maybe in another time for sure. sure, sure. Um, Last kind of major question I have for you is that, you know, you've been developing a lot of these in your spare time, these packages. Yeah. A lot, I don't think they've come from your actual work. And then recently you set up a Patreon account to kind of help 
generate a bit of funding for your efforts, but um, just curious how that came about and is that something you want to keep going or find other ways to earn um, revenue for your open source well, efforts? Or? So, so, uh, so the Patreon account is, well it's there, but I hate asking for money, so mm -hmm. I don't really advertise it. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of a strange middle ground. It, it came about because I was, uh, I was invited to speak at PlotCon uh, last spring mm -hmm. um, and thought I had Made a uh, made it work with the funding for the travel, but they kind of uh, jumped away. Not not PlotCon uh, conference, but but it was my old supervisor that kind of things fell apart, and he could suddenly not uh, pay for the travel like two weeks in advance, which was kind of annoying. <laughs> um, and so, uh, like, kind of out of nowhere, just well, let's see if I can get some money through mm -hmm. Patreon or whatever to, to go there because I, I said I would go and I didn't have money to, to fly to San Francisco. Mm. Um, and, and that went quite well and, and uh, Plotly, which was the, mayor, the organizer of PlotCon, uh, chipped in as well for the, with the rest, so, so that was really nice. And then it has just kind of been there ever since. Um, so I, I do s occasionally write something, but as I said, I, I really don't like asking for money mm. so so it's, it's just there and uh, people are I, I'm absolutely grateful for people chipping in um, but I don't think I will use much more like time and, and okay. effort on it right now at least um, sure sure it's all like uh, there's there are f a few people in or a couple of people in the open source community that can actually like live on uh, on donations for, through Patreon or whatever, but but I mean that that's very very few, and they they're really, really the central people maintaining stuff, and, and yeah, and and for all our others, it's just like uh, it's nice money, but it's it's not really why we're doing it because it it doesn't really it's nice to have, but it's it's not essential for our living. Okay. So okay. so it, it's nice to get it, but. But we don't do it to, to earn those money. We do it because we, we cannot help ourselves or because yeah. we think it's funny or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I think we'll just lay there for a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those things where sometimes we wonder how do we best contribute to people like you and many others in the community that are doing such awesome work. And obviously we want to help report bugs or help with any features that you want people to review. But sometimes there may be the situation where, hey, if we can just give you a little extra revenue, then maybe that gives you a little more oh, sure, time. Sure, so. sure. I mean, uh, it's, it's appreciated a lot. Yeah. Um, but as I said, it's not really the main motivation. To sure. show, so it, it makes me happy, of course. Yeah, but, oh, of course. Yeah, right. But that's kind of it. So Okay, yeah. Well, <laughs> not I'm, to deter anyone from not uh, chipping in, of course, but it's well, not like they, they shouldn't feel that, that they have to like pay me to be grateful for what I'm doing. I mean, I, I just, I'm happy if users are happy. So <laughs> it's just... Yep. yep, I've been the same way too. So the only thing I've done for, for this show is maybe a PayPal account. I mean, I don't even know if I'll ever do Patreon. I know some podcasts do, but it's like, yeah. if people, if more than one person listens to it, it's a success, success to me. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. So, um, yeah, it's been awesome to talk with you. Um, anything else you'd like to tell our listeners and how would they best be able to follow your efforts in the community? Uh, well, I don't really know. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So I think if, if they're interested in whatever, I'm doing then I'm kind of always broadcasting whatever I'm doing like uh, new features I'm working on or whatever I've, I'm kind mm -hmm. of open about the development process and just saying well now I'm trying to do this and this and this so, so if they're interested then they can just follow me there and uh, yeah I have a blog that is mainly just package announcement because I don't have time to actually write <laughs> any other kind of blogs right now uh, at data imaginist um, yes. So, so they can they can be there as well. Um, otherwise, if they're uh, just put a go to my GitHub account, uh, file issues, make PR, say hi. That's uh, that's fantastic. Awesome. We'll have links to all that in the show notes. And um, thanks again for joining me. It's sure. a pleasure to meet you in person, and nice look to forward talk to, to talking to you more in the future. Sure. All right, everybody. We'll be back right after this. Okay, I hope you really enjoy those conversations with, with Romain and Thomas. I really enjoy meeting them for the first time. And like I said, with Romain's case, I, I've admired him for quite a while. I, it, it's, it, but it was, it was very interesting to see that, 
you know, it's not like he had these really grand visions of where, say, RCPP would go. And now his um, his newer efforts with his interfacing with the Go language, he's really just trying things out. He's not afraid to fail. He's not afraid to make a few missteps along the way because he knows he can learn from them and he can apply them to his next effort. So I am very intrigued where he goes, so to speak, with, with his uh, exploits with the Go language and um, his next endeavors. And then, yeah, Thomas is a brilliant guy. I've, it's been great to, great to meet him in person. I'm going to keep a very close eye on... It's, it's funny, the things he's working on, I have projects that are involving each of them in different ways. So between the ggGraph and, tid and tidygraph, those I'm doing some network stuff for work, and then, you know, Fiery is something where I'm, like like I mentioned in the interview, I'm trying to see if there are ways that, in the cases where Shiny doesn't do everything I need to build a robust API. So I've got I got a lot of research to do, but Thomas is definitely looking for looking for feedback, and I'm definitely ready to try those things out. So. So I think with that, I'm going to probably wrap this episode up because I know we'll have uh, additional episodes coming soon with more, hopefully, really great interviews from, from our studio comp. And I'll also give you my impressions of the talks that I've attended. I'm also attending the Tidyverse training. Or actually, I should say I have attended it since I'm recording this segment at the, about the midway point in the conference itself. I'll be honest, my brain is still a little fried about some things, especially around tidy evaluation. But as usual, Hadley finds a way to prod me enough to find little nuggets that make it all click. So that's all my my thoughts on that will be coming as I get more practice of that. It's a it's like a brave new world to me. I've been using R since 2005, but now with the tidyverse, it's it's frankly the way I wish I had started. So to me, it's I agree with David Robinson on this. If you're going to start with R, this is the best place to start. Even, and then augment things with, with other um, parts of the, of the ecosystem as you go along. So yeah, we'll talk about that in another time. So that's, like I said, that's going to wrap up episode 23 of the R podcast. Um, if you want to hear the previous episodes and you want to keep up to date, the best place to do that is um, the podcast website at r-podcast.org. The podcast is on iTunes as well as Pocket Cast. Um, just search for DR Podcast, and apparently you have to have that exact search term. <laughs> and I want to thank one of the people I met um, at the conference this uh, about a couple nights ago who pointed out that somehow the iTunes feed on my site was broken. That has probably been fixed. Um, so I definitely welcome your feedback on suggestions. There is a contact page on the website. You can just go to r-podcast.org slash contact. We have a little contact form right there. And yeah, I'm always eager to hear your suggestions on future content. I got a few ideas that I'll mention as we go along. So thank you so much for listening. It's been, like I said, it's great to be back. And until next time. End of line.